Mary continues. And to the greater confusion of the negligent ministers of the church in our days, I desire thee to understand that in his eternal decrees the Most High dispenses his infinite treasures of the souls through the ministry of the prelates, priests, preachers, and teachers of his divine word. As far as his will is concerned, they might be, they might all be angelic rather than human in their holiness and perfection. They might enjoy many privileges and exemptions of nature and grace, and thus become fit ministers to the Most High, if only they would not pervert the order of his infinite wisdom, and if they lived up to the dignity to which they are called and chosen before all others. This infinite kindness of God is just as great now as in the first ages of the Church. The inclination of the highest goodness to enrich souls is not changed, nor can it be. His condescending liberality has not diminished. The love of his church is always at its height. His mercy is just as much concerned at the miseries of men, which in our times are become innumerable. The clamor of the sheep of Christ is louder than ever. The prelates, priests, and ministers are more numerous than here or two. heretofore. If this is so, to what is to be attributed the loss of so many souls and the ruin of the Christian people? Why is it that the infidels not only do not enter the church, but subject it to so much affliction and sorrow, that the prelates and ministers do not shine before the world, exhibiting the splendors of Christ as in the ages gone by and in the primitive church? O oh, my daughter, I invite thee to let thy tears flow over this loss and ruin, Consider how the stones of the sanctuary are scattered about in the streets of the city. See how the priests of the Lord have assimilated themselves to the people, Isaiah 24, 2, when, on the contrary, they should raise the people to the holiness which is due to priesthood. The sacerdotal dignity and the precious vestments of virtue are soiled by contagion with the worldly. The anointed of the Lord, consecrated solely to his worship and intercourse, have lapsed from their noble and godlike station. They have lost their beauty in debasing themselves to vile actions unworthy of their exalted position among men. They affect vanity. They indulge greed and avarice. They serve their own interests. They love money. They place their hopes in treasures of silver and gold. They submit to the flatteries and to the slavery of the worldly and powerful, and to their still lower degradation, they subject themselves to the petty whims of women and sometimes make themselves participants in their counsels of malice and wickedness. There is hardly a sheep in the fold of Christ which recognizes in them the voice of its pastor or finds from them the nourishment of that redeeming virtue and holiness which they should show forth. The little ones ask for bread and there is none to distribute. And if it is dealt out in self-interest, or as a compliment, how can it afford wholesome nourishment to the necessitous and infirm from such leprous hands? How shall the heavenly physician confide to such administers the medicine of life? Or how can the guilty ones intercede and mediate mercy for those who are less or even equally guilty? These are the reasons why the prelates and priests of our times do not perform the miracles of the apostles and disciples and of those who in the primitive church imitated their lives by an ardent zeal for the honor of the Lord and the conversion of souls. On this account, the treasures of the blood and death of Christ in the church do not bear the same fruits, either in his priests and ministers, nor in the other mortals. For if they neglect and forget to make them fruitful in themselves, how can they expect them to flow over on the rest of the human family? On this account the infidels are not converted on learning of the true faith, although they live within sight of the princes of the church, the ministers and preachers of the gospel. The church in our times is richer in temporal goods, rents and possessions. It abounds with learned men, great prelaces and multiplied dignities. And as, as all these advantages are due to the blood of Christ, they ought all to be used in his honor and service promoting the conversion of souls, supporting his poor, and enhancing the worship and veneration of his holy name. Is this the use made of the temporal riches of the church? Let the captives answer whether they are ransomed by the rents of the church. Let the infidels testify whether they are converted, whether heresies are extirpated. 
at the expense of the ecclesiastical treasures, but the public voice will loudly proclaim that from these same treasures pa palaces were built, prim primogentures established, the airy nothingness of noble titles bought, and, what is most deplorable, it is known to what profane and vile uses those that succeed in the ecclesiastical office put the treasures of the church, how they dishonor the high priest Christ, and in their lives depart just as far from the imitation of Christ and the apostles as the most profane men of the world. If the preaching of the divine word by these ministers is so dead and without power of vivifying the hearers, it is not the fault of truth or of the holy scriptures, but it is because of the abuse and the distorted intentions of those that preach it. They seek to compromise the glory of Christ with their own selfish honor and vain esteem, the spiritual goods with base acquisition of stipends, and if those two selfish ends are reached, they care not for other results of their preaching. Therefore they wander away from the pure and sincere doctrine, and sometimes even from the truth which the sacred authors have recorded in the scriptures, and according to which the holy teachers have explained them. They slime it over with their own ingenuous and ingenuous subtleties, seeking to cause rather the pleasure and admiration of their hearers than their advancement. As the divine truths reach the ears of the sinners so adulterated, they impress upon the mind rather the ingenious, in, ingenuous sophistry of the preacher, then the charity of Christ, they bring with it no force or efficacy for penetrating the hearts, although full of in, ingen, ingenuous, I'm sorry, artifice to delight the ears. <clears throat> Let not the chastisement of these vanities and abuses, and of others unknown to the world, astonish thee, my dearest, and be not surprised that divine justice has so much forsaken the prelates, ministers, and preachers of his word, or that the Catholic Church, having such an exalted position in its beginnings, should now be brought to such low estate. And if there are some priests and ministers who are not infected with these, these lamentable vices, the Church owes so much the more to my divine Son in these times, which he is so deeply offended and outraged. With those that are zealous, he is more liberal, but they are few in number, as is evident from the ruin of the Christian people, and from the from the contempt into which the priests and preachers of the gospel have fallen. For if the number of the perfect and the zealous workers were great, without a doubt sinners would reform and amend their lives. Many infidels would be converted. All would look upon and hear with reverence and fear such preachers, priests, and prelates. They would respect them for their dignity and holiness, and not for their usurped authority and outward show which induces a reverence too much like worldly applause and altogether without fruit. Do not be afraid or abashed for having written all this, for they themselves know that it is the truth, and thou dost not write of thy own choice, but at my command. Hence, bewail such a, such a sad state, and invite heaven and earth to help thee in thy weeping, for there are few who sorrow on account of it. And this is the greatest of all the injuries committed against the Lord by the children of the church. <clears throat> the conversion of St. Paul and the part taken therein by Most Holy Mary, Other Hidden Mysteries. <clears throat> Our mother, our mother the Church, governed by the Divine Spirit, celebrates the conversion of St. Paul as one of the greatest miracles of grace for the consolation of sinners. For, from a violent and blasphem blasphemous persecutor of the name of Christ, as St. Paul calls himself, 1 Timothy 1, 13, he was changed to an apostle obtaining mercy through divine grace. As in obtaining it, our great queen bore such a prominent part this rare miracle of the Omnipotent must not be passed over in this history, but its greatness can be better understood if the state of St. Paul as a persecutor of the Church at the time of his calling is explained, and when the causes which induced him to signalize himself as such a strong champion of the Law of Moses and bitter persecutor of Christ are known. 
St. Paul was distinguished in Judaism for two reasons. The one was his own character, and the other was the diligence of the demon in availing himself of his naturally good qualities. St. Paul was of a disposition generous, magnanimous, most noble, kind, active, courageous, and constant. He had acquired many of the moral virtues. He glorified, he glorified in being a staunch professor of the law of Moses and in being studious and learned in it, although in truth he was ignorant of, his, of its essence, as he himself confesses to Timothy, because all his learning was human and terrestrial, like many Jews. He knew the law merely from the outside, without its spirit, and without the divine insight which was necessary to understand it rightly and to penetrate its mysteries. But as his ignorance seemed to him real knowledge, and as he was gifted with a retentive memory and keen understanding, he was a great zealot for the traditions of the rabbis. Galatians 1, 14. He, ju he judged it an outrage and absurdity that, as he thought, a new law invented by a man crucified as a criminal should be published in opposition to them and to th that law which was given by God himself and received by Moses on the mount. Exodus 24. Hence, he conceived a great hatred and contempt for Christ, his law, and his disciples. Steeped in this error, he called into activity all his mortal virtues, moral virtues, if that can be called virtue which was devoid of true charity, and prided himself much in combating the errors of others. For that is a common fault with the children of Adam, that they please themselves in some good work without making the much more important effort to reform some of their vices. In this self-deception lived, lived and acted Saul, deeply convinced that he was zealously promoting the honor of God and upholding the ancient law of Moses and its divine ordainments. It appeared to him that in acting thus he was defending God's honor, for he had not really understood this law, which in its ceremonies and figures was but temporal and not eternal, and which was necessarily to be abrogated by a more wise and powerful legislator, as Moses himself foretold. Deuteronomy 18.15 This indiscreet zeal and vehemence was fanned by the malice of Lucifer and his ministers, who irritated and roused him to even greater hatred against the law of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Many times have I, in the course of this history, mentioned the malicious attempts and infernal schemes of this dragon against the Holy Church. Among them was his anxious search for men who should serve as apt and efficient instruments and executors of his malice. Lucifer, by himself or his demons, although they are able to tempt men singly, are yet unable to raise up their rebellious banners in public or become leaders in any sect or sedition against God, unless it be through the assistance of some human being in leading on the blind and unenlightened. This cruel enemy was infuriated by the happy beginnings of the Holy Church. He feared its progress and burned with envy to see beings of a lower nature than himself raised to the participation of the divinity and glory which he himself had lost. He recognized the inclinations of Saul, his habits and the state of his interior, and all seemed to harmonize well with his own designs of destroying the Church of Christ through the willing hands of unbelievers. Lucifer consulted the other demons concerning this wicked plan in a meeting held especially for this purpose. With common accord, the dragon and others of the demons resolved ceaseless Ceaselessly, ceaselessly to urge on Saul by stirring up his anger against the apostles and the whole flock of Christ, using suggestions and reasoning adapted to his state of mind, and in order that he might be the sooner influenced by them, they were to represent his indignation as a virtue to be gloried in. The demons executed this resolve to the letter and without losing any occasion. Although Paul was dissatisfied and opposed to the teaching of our Lord even before his death on the cross, yet he had not de yet declared himself so zealous a defender of the law of Moses and an and ad adversary of the Lord. It was only at the death of St. Stephen that he showed the wrath which the infernal dragon had roused against the followers of Christ. As that enemy had found the heart of Saul on that occasion so ready to execute all his malicious suggestions, he became so arrogant in his malice that it seemed to him he need not desire more, and that this man would offer no resistance to any malice he ever could propose. In his impious presumption, Lucifer tried to induce Saul to attempt single-handed the life of all the apostles, 
and with still greater presumption, even the life of the most blessed Mary. To such a point of insanity rose the pride of this most bloodthirsty dragon, but he deceived himself. The disposition of Saul was most noble and generous, and therefore it appeared to him beneath his dignity and honor to stoop to such crimes and act the part of an assassin, when he could, as it seemed to him, destroy the law of Christ by the power of reasoning and open justice. He felt a still greater horror at the thought of killing the most blessed mother on account of the regard due to her as a woman, and because he had seen her so composed and constant in the labors and in the passion of Christ. On this account, she seemed to him magnanimity seemed to him a magnanimous woman and worthy of veneration. She had indeed won his respect, together with some compassion for her sorrows and afflictions, the magnitude of which had become publicly known. Hence he gave no admittance to the inhuman suggestions of the demon against the life of the most blessed Mary. This compassion for her hastened not a little the conversion of Saul. Neither did he further entertain the treacherous designs against the apostles, although Lucifer sought to make their assassination appear as a deed worthy of his courageous spirit. Rejecting all these wicked thoughts, he resolved to incite all the Jews to persecute the church until it should be destroyed together with the name of Christ. As the dragon and his cohorts could not attain more, they contented themselves with having brought Saul at least to this resolve. The dreadful wrath of these demons against God and his creatures can be estimated from the fact that on that very day they held another meeting in order to consult how they could preserve the life of this man whom they had found so well adapted to execute their malice. These deadly enemies well know that they had no jurisdiction over the lives of men and that they can neither give nor take life unless permitted by God on some particular occasion. Nevertheless, they wished to make themselves the guardians and the physicians of the life and health of Saul as far as their power extended, namely, by keeping active his forethought against whatever was harmful and suggesting the use of what was naturally beneficial to the welfare of life and limb. Yet with all their efforts, they were unable to hinder the work of grace when God so wished it. Far were they from suspecting that Saul would ever accept the faith of Christ and that the life which they were trying to preserve and lengthen was to redound to their own ruin and torment. Such events are provided by the wisdom of the Most High, in order that the devil, being deceived by his evil counsels, may fall in, into, his, into his own pits and snares, and in order that his machinations may serve for the fulfillment of the divine and irresistible will. Such were the decrees of the highest wisdom, in order that the conversion of Saul might be more wonderful and glorious. With this intention, God permitted Satan, after the death of St. Stephen, to instigate Saul to go to the chief priests with fierce threats against the, the disciples of Christ who had left Jerusalem and to solicit permission for bringing them as prisoners to Jerusalem from wherever they should find them, Acts 9.1. For this enterprise, Saul offered his person and possessions, and even his life. At his own cost and without salary, he made journey in order that the new law, preached by the, by the disciples of the crucified, might not prevail against the law of his ancestors. This offer was readily favored by the high priest and his counselors. They immediately gave to Saul the commission he asked, especially to go to Damascus, whither, according to report, some of the disciples had retired after leaving Jerusalem. He prepared for the journey, hiring officers of justice and some soldiers to accompany him. But his by far most numerous escort were the many legions of demons who, in order to assist him in this enterprise, came forth from hell, hoping that with all this show of force and through Saul they might be able to make an end of the church and entirely devastate it with fire and blood. This was really the intention of Saul, and the one with which Lucifer and his demons sought to inspire him and his companions. But let us leave him for the present on his journey to, to Damascus, anxious to seize all the disciples of Christ whom he should find in the synagogues of the city. And that's where I will stop for this reading. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, 
Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May God bless and keep you.